everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Michelle Graff, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief at National Jeweler. I'm pleased to welcome you to the latest episode of My Next Question, National Jewelers Webinar Series. Today's session features Senior Editor Fashion, Ashley Davis, in conversation with jewelry expert and author Joanna Hardy. Before I turn the discussion over to Ashley and Joanne, I just wanted to let our attendees know that if they have a question, they can drop it into the Zoom Q&A box at the bottom of their screens. I'll be back on after the discussion to share any questions with our panelists. Also, today's session is being recorded and will be available on the National Jeweler website this coming Friday, December 10th. Now I'll let Ashley get things started. Thank you so much. Hello, and thank you, Joanna, for joining us today. How are you? Very well, thank you very much. I wish I had a Christmas tree behind me. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm festive enough for the both of us. Don't you worry. <laughs> um, so we're so excited to have you on today. And it's perfect timing because your book, Sapphire, is out in time for the holiday season. Um, and before we get into Sapphire, I wanted to talk a bit about your background and kind of the different parts of the industry you've worked in. So first, I was hoping that you could tell us what initially drew you to the world of jewelry. Um, well, it goes back, I think, even before I realized myself, my, my godmother uh, was a jeweler, Margaret Biggs, and she had a, a jewelry shop in, uh, in the south of England. And when I was very small, I used to go with my parents and have tea and, uh, and she would have in her Georgian home, these amazing vitrines just filled with mineral specimens. And her sister, there were two spinsters and her mm -hmm. sister painted oil paintings, inclusions of gemstones. I mean, this is wow. going a long way back. So actually they were ahead of the game. Yeah. There were two, two spinsters that loved in the First World War. They didn't come back. And so they never loved again. And then I went to a school called Beedales in, in Hampshire and we could make jewelry. So I started making jewelry and I just, from the age of 14, and mm -hmm. I sort of, I just got got the bug but I think it was that appreciation of seeing these amazing gemstones and the jewels that were being created from those that from such a young age that it was like an osmosis I think and then I was very lucky I was at a school that allowed me to sit making jewelry rather than being in the chemistry lab uh, so preferable <laughs> for me very preferable <laughs> chemistry is my least favorite subject so I can understand the appeal of that um, so I was really interested to find out about the different parts of the industry you've worked in because I know you primarily through your books and as this expert and from the world of auctions. So I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about the different aspects of the industry that kind of led you to where you are now. Yes, I mean, after I, I left school and came up to do a foundation course and then I went to Sir John Cass College where I learned to, to make jewelry. <clears throat> I wasn't very good at it, but it gave me an incredible insight into the technical skill that you need to make a fabulous piece of jewelry. And I was working, I worked in Hatton Garden, which is sort of the, the jewelry street in London as a Saturday girl. And then I worked full-time in Hatton Garden. I left college. I studied gemology in the evenings and when I was about 18, I, um, I, someone said to me that De Beers were looking for uh, diamond, rough diamond graders. And I'd never heard of De Beers. I just thought, well, who are, who are they? Um, mm -hmm. And at the time, this is like over 35 years ago, they, um, you know, they, were, they did own the majority of the mines then. But I didn't know this, so in my ignorance, um, I went along and I um, had done my... Uh, diamond diploma in the evening so I had my gemology my diamond diploma but I had never seen a rough diamond in my whole entire life mm. anyway got the, got the job and and so I was valuing and grading rough um, which was an incredible experience and one where you couldn't do it anywhere else 
you know, it was really, it was in Charterhouse Street in London. And I just wanted to be, I wanted to go off to Africa. I wanted to go off and find these, these gems, but um, that wasn't going to happen because I was a woman uh, at mm -hmm. the time. So there was a, um, in the retail jeweler, there was uh, um, an advertisement for a, a, an assistant polished diamond dealer to live in Antwerp. And there's just the audacity of youth. I was 20. I didn't <laughs> know anything about polished diamonds. And I just thought, well, it's not Africa, it's Antwerp, but I'll <laughs> try that. It was, it was simple. Anyway, I, I got that job and I became a, a, a polished diamond dealer um, in, in Antwerp. And I lived in Antwerp. And that, again, was just an incredible experience. So that, that um, really, you know, that was all buying the polished. And then I had Scandinavia and London where I had to actually sell um, the, the diamonds, the loose diamonds. And I'd have them on me or on a carne. And I'd travel around for three weeks around Scandinavia, going to wholesalers at the time, selling diamonds. Wow. I mean, literally, there was no mobile phones. There was no internet. You, you know, I would sit in a hotel, put the diamonds in a hotel safe, and get the yellow pages out and phone people and say, would you like to buy oh, some diamonds? I mean, it was as simple as that. And then, and then I would have the orders and then I'd come back and then I would go off to Israel, to Ramat Gan three, four times a year to buy mm -hmm. with under the auspices of um, uh, Henry Jinder, who was my boss at the time. And then I had London and London was also my patch. And so English artworks who were, the workshops for Cartier, Mapping and Web, Garrard, all of these jewelers, I would try and sell my diamonds along with everybody else. So it was <laughs> quite, a, quite a learning curve. And then, and then um, I got a phone call from Phillips Yorkshireers, which are now Bonhams, and they, they wanted uh, a, a diamond specialist. And someone had told them about me. And I just thought, well, that would be fascinating but I know nothing about antique jewelry. <laughs> so, so I remember going from Antwerp, I'd go at weekends just before the interview and I'd sit in the v in the British Museum, trying to go through the jewelry gallery, trying to go through all the dates and periods and to try and, try and sound like I sort of know something when I got to the interview. <laughs> anyway, anyway, I, um, I went to Phillips, I got the job there, and that introduced me into the auction world, which was, which was, yeah, it was amazing. Uh, it was a great learning curve there because you saw everything. People were coming in with all sorts. And, uh, and I just found it an incredible world. And also I was being reintroduced to colored stones, which I had not um, seen for ages because I had just been in the diamond world you know, and those people all those people the diamond the diamond dealers I still know them today you know it's a, as we know it's a very uh -huh. small trusting community and uh, and I never had to worry about being a woman in a man's world at all because at the end of the day it was about trying to you know, if you were knowledgeable and if you if you knew what you were talking about it didn't really matter if you were a man, a man or a woman. So I, it was just a fabulous time. And then I went on a two year walkabout in my thirties. That's another book, <laughs> 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 but it's not jewelry related. So anyway, so, so I went on a walkabout. <laughs> um, and then um, I was going to work with Christie's or Sotheby's and I ended up working for Sotheby's. And so for 14 years, I was uh, at Sotheby's in London and their auctioneer. And that was also an amazing opportunity. And then the opportunity for the last 12 years has been, I've been independent. And that, I think this has been the best, the best 12 years so far of my mm. 35 year career. Because I've been able to, um, expand into other areas I mean with these three books that I've done when I look at Ruby Emerald and Sapphire you know it's taken nearly 10 years to write these books and I have traveled to nearly all the major colored gemstone mines in the world which wow. is really amazing and then and then I think that's what's been so wonderful is be able to see them from the source and then 
go and to the archives in Place Vendôme to you know to Boucheron and Chaumet and Cartier and Van Cleef and Arpels and and to be able to see the whole picture. Uh, I've been very, very, very fortunate, very fortunate. Which is very fitting for your career because you have probably the most diverse career experience of anyone I've ever met in jewelry, which is really getting that full picture. So I think these yeah. books are in a similar way, kind of give that same feel. Oh, thank you. I mean, I, I've tried to do that. You know, I've tried to make it not too, <clears throat> not too um, geeky <laughs> in terms of, you know, from a gemological point of view, because these are not gemological books. There are gemological right. books out there that are, you know, absolutely fabulous. And they go into the stones in great depth. And for me, I just wanted to try and put the stones into, a, into the social history context mm. and the people because our industry wouldn't be what it is without the people. So, you know, the people and the earth together, uh, are, yeah. I try to have joined them in one in, in these three books. Absolutely. Um, and so, yes, Emerald came out in 2014. That was the first of the big gemstone trilogy. Then Ruby in 2017 and Sapphire is the final of the big three out this year and in the introduction you wrote that after researching all three of these gemstones and so many interesting stories about different specimens that sapphire is actually your favorite which i thought was so fun to read because you know it's a little bit provocative to take a stance on that and pick a favorite but I'm curious what led to that preference after researching all of the stones and different jewels throughout history. Well, you know, <clears throat> it's, it's about color at the end of the day and everybody will have a favorite color that speaks to them. And you can look at stones from a gemological point of view. And I love, you know, all, you know, if they've got the, the rarity, the durability um, and the beauty, then something that catches my eye and makes me look twice you know, that for me is a special stone. But the more I was looking at sapphires, and I am saying all colored sapphires, so I am broadening my, broadening my net, so it's not just blue. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> but I do love the color blue. I mean, I do love the color blue. And I think because I love the blue skies and I love the blue horizon. And, and that's what, when I look at the sapphire, that's what it, reminds me of so I think everybody resonates with the color and then that color of course will translate into a gemstone and coupled with the blue of the sapphires and all the other colors of the sapphires it's their hardness and so their hardness allows you to really cut you know, have a great luster I mean not obviously not mm -hmm. as great as diamond but it's a it's it's the next best thing in terms obviously mm -hmm. of the hardness and the you know a pink sapphire or a, uh, a paparaccia sapphire you know there aren't any other colors like it um in yeah. fact with all colored gemstones you know they all have they might be you know five or six green stones but they all have a particular green that when you look at it you think oh I like that I like that peridot green rather than than emerald green you know and so for me I preferred the um the, the, the even though the hues of sapphires can change but it was with that it's with the hardness and and also the inclusions I I really like the inclusions in sapphires and that's what I've done yeah. with all three books with um, Chris Smith from AGL laboratory has just been so generous in, in supplying me with all the imagery of the inclusions that he's taken over the years of each of the stones. Are those um, and the first and last pages of the book? Well, they're all through actually. There's a, in oh, fact, okay. there's bits in the middle of uh, different colored sapphires and they have got mm. uh, their inclusions as well. But it, you know, the more I, the more I understood and, uh, and looked into the inclusions, I mean, they are, they're a moment of, of when the planet was virtually formed, you know, it's, it's mm. just quite incredible, the fingerprint of those inclusions of, and, and they were formed at the same time as, as um, mostly were formed at the same time as, as the host material. Yeah. 
but they're like abstract paintings so it probably is going back to my to my <laughs> godmother who had these abstract paintings on the wall right. illusions so there's a lot of synergy that you know you it's not obvious to start with but it makes a lot of sense and my mother used to um she would wear some great jewelry that uh, mm -hmm. my father would buy her or she would buy her own and they were quite contemporary jewels uh, and so again you know by osmosis I was surrounded by all, all this all these beautiful beautiful jewels and beautiful minerals yeah so lots of early influences there too yeah definitely definitely and then you see that's the beauty of this of this uh, industry is that you never stop learning you never I mean I would never I like calling myself a specialist I'm not an expert you know because I'm continually learning I um, like that a, and that's the beauty of this business um speaking of learning I would love to go into some of the specific jewels we kind of the way we did this is we kind of just cherry picked a few fantastic ones um a sort of a preview of the book and because they're just so many incredible stories it's it's funny because I was thinking that even someone who isn't into jewelry, but just someone who loved history would probably love a book like this because it's just a lot of it is using jewelry as your entree into a certain historical moment. So I'm going to share my screen. Now, even though I've written the book, I've got a brain <laughs> like a sieve. <laughs> so I have also got notes. So if anybody, anybody sees me looking down, you'll know that I'm looking at my notes, which only because I can't remember some of the you, dates. I think it's just age. I'm getting old. <laughs> but you, you couldn't possibly, um, you couldn't possibly remember everything. But oh, to no. start, <laughs> so this is the middle M jewel which is circa the Middle Ages, but discovered only in the 1980s. Could you tell us a bit about it? Yeah, I mean, have you got that up on the screen? It looks like a, I can only see I your- I do. Um... Maybe someone can tell me in the chat um, if- I can just see all the oh, images, but not the one on its own. Oh no, hmm. Maybe we'll let's try this. New screen. Oh, it's not showing single. Okay. Oh, here. Maybe now it is? That's it. Okay, great. That's it. Yes. Great. So this is the Middleham jewel, which was, um, as you said, it was it was found in 1985 by a metal detector. Uh, this is a photograph of the front and back of the jewel. It's 6.4 centimeters high, so it's quite a substantial jewel. And the fact that it was made at about 1450 to 1475. And I've actually handled this jewel. It's a, it's a reliquary jewel, meaning that it's it's got some cloth inside that was reputedly from a saint, possibly from a saint. So you've got here, this is a really potent jewel. Now, middle age, in the middle ages, you know, the goldsmiths were very meticulous in what they put on these jewels. They, you, could, you can see here, you've got the front, you've got the trinity, and you've got also, uh, which is the crucifix, the, uh, the crucifixion of, of Christ. You've got also the Virgin Mary uh, with the nativity on the reverse. And of course, in the Middle Ages, uh, Virgin Mary's robes were always blue as well. Mm -hmm. And you've got the one stone, which is sapphire. Now you'll see that there is a drill hole going through the center. If you look at all the early jewelry, the majority of sapphires will have a drill hole going through it because that was how they were traded. They were put on like rope strings of ropes oh and they God. would then, and that's how, and, and then that's why you will find that there is a, a drill hole. So nearly every old sapphire you see will have a drill hole. Also, 
with, with um, sort of Sri Lankans, um, well, the majority of the stones would come from Sri Lanka because Sri Lankan stones, they've been mined for about over two and a half thousand years. There is another deposit, which is France, which may have, um, you would also find some sapphires, um, oh. which you would, so that's, that's really, so that's very interesting, but I'm sort of deviating from this jewel. What do you <laughs> will see on, what do you will see on the front uh, with the sapphire is that it would have had um, enamel work, so all the enamel has come away, but it had the inscriptions um, around this side, which is um, to ward off epilepsy. And of course, epilepsy was always seen to be sort of the sickness of, of the devil then. Um, wow. And, you know, you must remember these middle age period of 1450, they were so superstitious. They, you know, the, the, it was, I mean, death was round every corner. So you wanted to hang on to anything that would give you hope or to give you protection against disease and death. And, and um, they had um, also around the outside is an engraved Latinized Hebrew spelling of the unutterable name of God, which was recited as a magical mantra by Christians in the Middle Ages. Wow. And so you... You and then you have on the on the reverse side, which is with the nativity, you have actually sixteen um, figures, and they're all saints. And the majority of those saints are actual female saints. So when this was found, this was found in Middleham Castle in North Yorkshire, which is the home or was the home childhood home of Richard the Third. And he married Anne Neville. And it's thought to believe that it's either she owned it or her mother or um, his mother. And because one of the, I mean, one of many threats, but one of the main threats for, for women of this period was of course childbirth. Oh and, and so this may, there is a thought that this could have been a jewel to actually help uh, women in childbirth. And it would be um, that it is known that um, Anne Neville uh, was one of the ladies who would be at a, at a you know, present at, at a childbirth. And so she would have this jewel with her to protect, to protect the woman. So you can imagine, I mean, losing that. <laughs> yes! <that's> such, a, <laughs> such a powerful jewel. And also there is, a, you, we think that there might have been uh, pearls as well. So from Sri Lanka during this period, the Middle Ages, you, you had pearls that were being exported. And of course, pearls were about purity. So you had Ooh. sapphire that represented the heavens, and then you had pearls that represented purity. So, you know, the, the, these talismans were so incredibly important to the to the um to the to the public you know they wouldn't be seen without having something to believe in uh you know sort of this magical magical superstition along with religion yes so much faith and superstition within that faith yeah and and the, and the sapphire is the most um used uh gemstone in the middle ages to represent, because it represented the heavens. And that's why you had bishops rings that were set with, with sapphires too, because they felt the light from the sky would come through from the gods and the divine power would come through the sapphire and it would be an open setting so that the sapphire would touch the skin. And so that would help the bishops um, speak the truth. <laughs> I mean, it should. I mean, they should be speaking the truth anyway. But um, yes, apparently this. Who doesn't apparently need a little reminder? <laughs> just, just a little reminder, exactly. Um, now <laughs> I found then, that fascinating, and to actually hold it in your hand, you oh feel that there is a. Um, you you you've got sort of gosh, you've got like decades and decades and hundreds of years of potency in your hand. I mean, it's it weighs heavier in your hand than it is because of just because of the, the psyche of the it. historical import yeah of yeah. that um 
and it was love- stopped. It, it had a, it had an export license, and it it was it it was stopped um, to be exported. So uh, it was able to be bought and uh, put on display in the Yorkshire Museum. That's where you can yes, see it now. Yes, because and then a fun little fact, which obviously is not the most important part of the story, but I loved it, was the fact that it had been lost, and someone um, who was they were legally allowed to do this, but they were just had a metal detector kind of treasure hunting on this estate found it. Um, and it had truly been for hundreds of years, had yeah. just gotten somehow lost in the dirt. So in the 1980s, someone discovered this. Um, that's right. I mean, that's called the Treasure Trove Act. So you must, if it's over 300 years old, you must tell the local coroner. And if it's a hoard, if it's been deemed to have been hidden on purpose, then it is, then it belongs to the crown. But if it's been found because it was lost, then it can be sold and the proceeds split between the, the person who found it and the person whose land it was found on. Ah, uh, okay. That makes sense. And then, so the next jewel that we're going to, um, and this is such a fitting order now, it's, the design is obviously so simple, but what I loved about this jewel in particular was the fact that it had a very different um, symbolic interpretation, just depending on cultures. So this belonged to the Maharaja of Indore, um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about this piece. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so what's interesting about this, yes, is what's interesting about gemstones is that there's every culture will have either a similarity or they'll have a bit of a difference um, in terms of how they portray the gemstones. And with sapphire, with blue sapphire, in the Hindu astrology, uh, the blue sapphire is represented by the planet Saturn. And Saturn is a planet that when it is in your chart, you've got to be a little bit careful. It's, it's, it's not all good. Um, and so uh, the Maharaja of Indore, he, I have a picture of, um, in my book of, by Man Ray. Of, yes, I'll, uh, I'll show that in a minute. Oh, uh, okay. So the, the fact that he is wearing it so prominently being a Hindu he must have had total trust and faith in his astrologer who would have told mm. him that it would be good luck for him to wear it uh, so this is um, called a Travis a Tavis cut it's uh, 23.2 carats wow. it's faceted all it's an old stone but if you see, you see that line at the back, or well, that line is a groove where a surface reaching inclusion has been cut away because it was believed as well that um, sapphires, uh, well, any gemstone that had impurities sort of um, weakened its potency. So if you had anything that was, that was unsightly, they'd want to get rid of it. So that's where you can see that they've actually got rid of it. And then of course the actual chain is a later Cartier chain that's gone through the drill hole at the top, which would have been um, achieved by a diamond drill. But that was one of the, uh, one of the many fascinating um, uh, things I learned while writing the um, Sapphire book was that there's a lot of early gemstones that uh, sapphire blue sapphires that look like they've got sort of dimples and it's where they've cut away any surface reaching unsightly inclusions um and really quite uh <laughs> remarkable and they're very it's very subtle as well uh and uh, so that was that was quite a that was quite a revelation for me and to see him here with his very, they were both a very young couple. Unfortunately, she, she died at the age of 22. Um, oh this, is a, this is a photograph of in 1927, taken in 1927 by Man Ray. And you could see, could see here how prominent that sapphire is. And him being a Hindu. And what you will find in South India, there's um, 
there's in South India, there's you know, jewels are given to deities in in, in gratitude, uh, and there is I have a picture in the book of a deity covered in blue sapphires. Oh. So obviously there was that that devotee. He had Saturn in his in his uh, astrology at that time in that period, and it was doing him a lot of good. So he wanted to he wanted to thank the gods for his good luck, and so he has bestowed on the deities um, blue sapphires. So I thought that was fascinating. The jewels that are underneath in those temples, unbelievable. Oh uh, but no gosh. one will know what's no one will ever know what's what's beneath what's beneath the temples. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I just I loved the inclusion of this Man Ray portrait as well because um, it just gives such a great sense of the jewel and I mean I, I love this period of, of the 1920s and he mm. just looks like such a modern dapper young man like I could just see such a simple style like that I could see some very cool man wearing that today yeah yeah, it, it is absolutely timeless, isn't it? Um, and and they were a very, very handsome, handsome cu couple. Oh, look, someone said Harry Styles. Yeah, Harry Styles would definitely, <laughs> oh, uh, definitely <absolutely>. wear it. <laughs> um, now, royalty is, you know, such a major topic when it comes to jewelry history. And the reason that we have some really fantastic jewels to look at and we see them so relevant in auctions today so a very special one here we have there are tons of royal jewels in this book um, and this is the Stuart sapphire and i would love to hear a little bit about this one and how the cullinan diamond kind of stole the spotlight from this special sapphire well, the reason why there's so many uh, crowns in this um, in, in the Sapphire book is because you will find in nearly every orb or cross, there will be a sapphire at the very top because mm. the sapphire is representing the heavens. And of course, uh, the heads of heads of um, royalty were always looked um, to be the head of the church. And so, again, their, their head would be. With, with the sapphire, which would also be relating to them being um, connected to, to the divine heavens. Okay. So, um, so can we see the crown? Can you all see Oh, sorry, can you not? Um, do you see it? Yes, I can see it. Yeah, okay. I can see it. Yeah. So, so this is a um, 104 carat uh, sapphire. Now, again, it's from Ceylon. And when you look at it, there's a drill hole through it. Mm. So again, this was um, the House of Stuart, Ceylon uh, Sapphire that uh, came into the House of the Stuarts in about 1633 to 1701. And I mean, you know, we've got so many kings and queens, I couldn't possibly bore you with all the, <laughs> mainly because I wouldn't be able to remember them all. <laughs> but uh, it goes through uh, James II at, of England, actually smuggled it out of England into France and it went through a whole host of, um, of uh, um, royalty and then it was ended up being bought by an Italian dealer before being sold back into the English the English royal families and it was at the front along with the the region the the um, prince's ruby which of course is a sapphire um, and it was set at the front but when uh, the Cullinan was um, found in uh, 1905, uh, then it pushed the Stuart Sapphire from the front to the back, um, and uh, you had the Cullinan at the front, probably because, uh, maybe because it was a very strange, you know, the Cullinan, uh, you've got the Cullinan 1, which is in the scepter, and Cullinan 2, which is the, the front of the, of the imperial the state crown. Um, but there was a lot of hype with diamonds then, you know, and I and I would and it was, you know, the largest diamonds that had ever been uh, largest rough that had ever been found. And uh, these were the largest polished at the time. So and it was they were given 
after Edward the Seventh, so it only seemed, um, I suppose, fitting to have it at the front along with the Prince's Ruby. So the Stuart Sapphire oh, was oh. was at the back, along with, of course, the St Edward's Sapphire, which is at the top there, and it is the oldest gem in the royal collection. Wow. But blue has because of because of its um, association with the heavens and and with the divine power it has and also uh, its belief that it symbolized um, constancy so the royal families have really um, revered the blue sapphire and of course I think you're going to show the next one which is uh, Prince Albert and Queen Victoria's yes the coronet and my royal history isn't the best, but whenever something from Queen Victoria comes to auction, I always love it. I just love the story of their relationship and the many kind of jewels that celebrate it. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Ashley. I mean, they 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 loved the uh, the decorative arts. You know, they really did. They they you know, took it away from Paris and brought it to England. Uh, the appreciation of of the arts, and they. Prince Albert loved blue sapphires. He he gave uh, Queen Victoria on their wedding night um, a, a sapphire and diamond brooch, which which the Queen now wears as well. And this is, you know, this is an incredible uh, coronet. It's incredibly flexible. Uh, there's I think there's about twenty three hinged sections. It was made by um, a jeweler. Kitchling a bud, and uh, they were jewelers to the queen, um, and she made them jewelers to the queen in 1837. And it's incredibly flexible. I mean, it is beautifully made, and you'll see that the sapphires don't quite um, match, and that's because they were taken from um, other pieces of jewelry uh, that they had. So mm. they were not. So they weren't cut to fit the crown. It's sort of like they were, the crown was sort of made and these were repurposed. And you've got, uh, and the actual design uh, was to, uh, it was representing uh, Prince Albert's coat of arms as well. But she, she when, when he died in um, 1861, uh, she was in mourning as we know, and she wouldn't wear much color at all. Uh, and that was also uh, with, with gemstones. But she did wear this in 1866 when she opened Parliament. And this was the first time that she'd sort of come out of mourning. And I think that was, again, a, a huge symbolic uh, yes. statement in that she clearly was opening Parliament on her own without him. But she wore the one thing that they had designed and made um, sort of together uh, and so it's as if he was still with her and wow. and it was this that was actually on uh, her coffin as she um uh, later on but it was it, she, it was a really uh, a very important jewel and because it's so flexible it could be made you know to go around the bun at the back of her head or it could be um, worn sort of in the front of the forehead and again it was um it was stopped, the export license was stopped so that uh, we had the opportunity to be able to uh, secure it. And it was the Bollingers who very kindly and generously uh, secured it for, for um, to be showcased in the Victoria and Albert Museum, which is where it is today. And yes, I remember you, you told me that it's in a place of pride in the v &A Museum. And have you interacted with this personally? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. It is again. It's it's very, it's very special because you know jewelry, jewelry and gemstones, um, it's all about emotion. And that is that's a very very emotional jewel. Absolutely. And then, in addition to the VNA, I became very interested in Munich's residence treasury and museum, which you talked about in one section of, of Sapphire, and that's home to pieces that go back for more than 1,000 years. 
and they have some incredible crowns, including this one that belonged to Blanche of Lancaster. And it was created, they believe, in the 1380s. Can you tell us a this, bit about this one? So the Munich residency is, it was the house of um, Bulgaria. And it's, and if you, if anybody finds themselves in Munich, they must go to see the Munich residency. It is a wealth of fabulous jewelry and crowns and this is actually the oldest English crown and uh, it's um as you said it was made for Anne of Bohemia to start with it's each prong is 18 centimeters high so it is when you walk in there are three crowns there's one reliquary crown um and there's uh there's two others and this is one of them and to think that it was made in 1382, the enamel work, the goldsmithing, the craftsmanship wow. is absolutely superb. You've got pearls, and you've and you've got you've got pink sapphires there. You've got spinels, um, wow. and to think how these travelled from Sri Lanka, that's that's what gets wow. me. Is you know, the journey that these must have taken, and of course, again. The majority, as you will see, have got drill holes through them. So you can see that all the all the all the blue sapphires had drill holes through them. So they but, would have been almost strung like the way that um, pearls will be. Exactly, exactly, uh -huh. and they were like traded in that way. Oh my gosh! Yeah. So that for me, every time I go, um, I always like to. Uh, I like to look at this and I'm always in awe of it um but uh, you know it was she she died when she was only 28 years old uh, Anna Bohemia but she married she married Richard II oh and, uh, okay but the fact that it survived and it hasn't a it's survived and it hasn't been melted down or the stones yes. have been switched or changed I mean it is really really remarkable really remarkable I do appreciate the care that people have taken to preserve things and then hopefully place them in museums in this day and age. Um, <clears throat> well, you're absolutely right. And in fact, there's there's um, which a chapter that I had in the Sapphire book, which I didn't have in the other two, and that was the art of collecting. And I talk about uh, there's six collectors, three are anonymous. But what was lovely was to see some of the jewels that I remember from years ago when I was even at, uh, at Phillips of seeing jewels uh, that are safe, that, are, that they're in a custodian that is going to look after these jewels for, you know, for future generations. And as you say, you know, museums are so important mm -hmm. um, to be able to, to, to keep this moment in time because you can learn so much from, from jewels. Absolutely. And then for our next one, we'll just fast forward a few <laughs> hundred years. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> and because in a totally different mood, but we, we have to talk about Elizabeth Taylor, of course, if we're taking this great survey of sapphires. Um, there are many included in the book that she owned, but this one you used to kind of demonstrate her relationship with Bulgari, which in the 1970s was really championing, championing um, wearing jewelry in a more casual way, which is very cool, you know, very much still a big topic in jewelry. So I wanted to talk about this Bulgari piece that she received for her 40th birthday. <laughs> How, can you imagine receiving this for your 40th? I think yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. I mean, she did have the most incredible jewelry, as we all know. And uh, and this, of course, you know, Bulgari were really they were flourishing in the 60s and 70s, and you know, the blue sapphire almost became their trademark. Uh, because you could have all the wonderful different colors and they were big and bold because you have the sapphires have, you know, they do come in on the whole bigger crystals um, than obviously the emeralds and the rubies. And you've got the pendant there, which can be detached and worn as a, worn as a brooch. 
And during that period, you had, you know, Hollywood was coming to Rome. You had quite a, quite a few uh, um, films that were being that were being shot in Rome. And of course, Cleopatra was one of them. Mm-hmm. And that's when she met Richard Burton. And uh, she was filming Cleopatra in 1963. And they say that's when she discovered Bulgari. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, so this one here, this was made, um, made in 1969. And they bought it in, as you said, in 1972. And it's a 62 carat uh, sort of sugar loaf, which means it's got sort of the four conical sides uh, and it's uh, a Burmese, a Burmese stone. And again, you know, that, um, that uh, it's symbolizing constancy and, and the earth and, and the, not the earth, but the heavens. And I just love that connection, which obviously they had such a powerful connection together. And, uh, and this, this, as with all her other jewels of Bulgari, they really did um, speak volumes, um, apart, from, apart from being a very lucky woman. <laughs> yes, and I, I loved relating to Bulgari. There was this fantastic anecdote that um, Eddie, her, her husband before, Eddie Fisher, had purchased her some jewels from, from Bulgari as she was really forming this relationship with the house. And, um, but it wasn't enough to save his marriage. So then when she was then in love with Richard Burton, Eddie Fisher ended up sending some of the invoices for the pieces he was having made for Elizabeth Taylor um, over to Richard Burton. Yeah, she, so. well, she said she, she thinks that she paid, she, you know, she paid for some of those jewels or, or um, yes, he tried to make sure that Richard Burton was going to pay for them. <laughs> yes, that's sort of quite funny. But, you know, she even she did wear quite a lot of jewels uh, um, on set. And that was very similar to the Hollywood greats of, I've uh, got um, the star sapphires of the Hollywood greats of the 40s mm. and 50s. And again, you know, they would they would wear their jewels and they, and and star sapphires were very much uh, the stone of choice during that period but mm. you know you wanted to wear jewelry that that could be easily noticed um, on camera and so right. this is sort of like a revival of that of that period of the 40s the, the 60s and the 70s sort of this big bold jewelry and and as you say being worn sort of casually um, even swimming in swimming pools apparently <laughs> 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 So, I mean, I have that image that I think you're referencing with Elizabeth Taylor in the pool with her jewels. It just doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> yes, it's just fabulous. <laughs> now, um, and then of course the book Sapphire also goes into some contemporary artists and um, and what the house, what the big jewelry houses are making today. And I was really excited to find this goldsmith and gemstone cutter named Mark Newell, who I believe is based in London, but he is Australian and very has a very interesting um, kind of trajectory through the, the goldsmithing and cutting world. And um, he is someone working today and I thought he'd be perfect to leave off. Yes, I mean, that's what, so what I want to, be able to showcase is is not just you know not just the big houses and the big names but also um there's so much talent uh where people you know it's very difficult for individuals to get heard um and uh mark newell is i've known him for for a long time and he cuts you know he cuts his own stones as well as make make the ring make the jewelry and that's very rare you very rarely do you get someone who can do both and it was when I was um talking with him and he was explaining how his parents were sapphire miners in the outback of Australia in the 70s and I and he as we spoke I just I couldn't believe his story of just literally he and his two his brother and his sister they lived in this corrugated hut in Ruby Vale, outside of Ruby Vale in Queensland in the 70s with an emu as a pet. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
their their parent his parents were English. Uh, they were what's called a ten pound poms. That's when they went over to Australia, uh, and it cost them ten pounds um, to go oh, there in the seventies because Australia was wanting uh, um, more skilled uh, labour. So it was wow. just to it was to um, entice people to to come to the to the new to the new land, and um, so his father was sort of just went weekends sort of foster king for for gems and he got hooked and then he wanted to live in the outback and became this sapphire miner and mark all through his childhood that's that's where he that's where he lived and went to school and and there were a cutter uh, a couple of german um cutters that were also there and so he learned to cut with them and his and his mum was was like the broker she would she would go off and sell the gems that her husband had found that week or that month and she would be trading with um, the ties that came over at the time and and it was just quite an extraordinary story and and Mark obviously you know he he learned you know that's what you find with people that when they work with gemstones that it's it's part of them the gemstones become mm. part of them and for Mark he very much was part of of the sapphire world but he wanted like any like most young kids you know they want to branch out and so he came over to London and uh, but he continued to perfect the craft of of cutting and the technical skill and what I like about his is that he really follows the crystal structure um, he does it you know, most of his stones don't actually have a table so he sort of just designs and creates the cut according to his mood and according to the crystal. And he wow. still buys all his um, sapphires from the same people that his father used to used to work with um, in Ruby Vale. And he doesn't use them as heat treated stones. He just cuts them and uses them as natural. That's why at the bottom you've got a yellow one and a greeny, a greeny bluey sapphire. In fact, the bottom two uh, the goldsmiths company had bought them for uh, their collection um, so that's so that's really lovely but um, a very talented a very talented man and and wonderful to be able to put him and his family's story in the book because at the end of the day it's about it's about people you know it's and uh, when I spoke to her I interviewed his mum um, over Zoom, of course, because it was uh, you know, the COVID uh, situation. And she was just, you know, she just came alive when just talking about that period. She said it was so exciting. Um, and it was while I was talking to her that uh, she said, oh, there was this, um, this old boy and he had um, this big sort of uh, doorstop of a stone uh, a rock which he kept for 10 years as a doorstop and then sort of decided well maybe maybe it's something and he it, in fact it turns out to be the black star of Queensland and which is which was um cut in the states and I said oh hang on a minute I've got a picture of Cher wearing the the black star of Queensland she said, that's it that's the stone oh that was a doorstop God. for ages and it was just yeah, you know, little things like that that I just, I just absolutely love. I just think, oh, that's just, that was just brilliant, you know. But yeah. uh, really, yeah, very, very special. Everybody um, has been so generous in sharing their, their stories with me. So um, I hope that uh, they've all, yeah, they're all pleased with the, with the inclusion in the book. I've enjoyed talking to them and meeting them. I mean, especially for a contemporary designer and artist and cutter today, I mean, to be included in a book that has royal historical jewels, that has graph and bulgari and just everyone you can imagine. I mean, I'm sure it's thrilling to be yeah. included with them. Um, yeah. And then fun for us to, to have so many different things to discover. Exactly, exactly. Yes. And that's, and that's, that's what makes this, for me, I think it makes it so rich is because of the variety. 
and the diversity. And, and that is actually sapphire more than the other two stones. I think sapphire seems to have touched more people from all walks of life than the other two, I would say. That's very interesting. Well, it's nice that you've been able to end the gemstone trilogy on kind of a personal high note then. Yeah. Um, but thank you so much for chatting with us. And now we will turn it over to Michelle to see if we have any audience questions. Thank you, Ashley. And thanks so much, Joanna. That was so interesting. I could have on it. I could sit here till 5 p.m. and listen to you <laughs> talk about the various jewels. I think jewelry history and it's so interesting. And I think Ashley made a great point at the beginning of the discussion. You don't even have to be into jewelry to appreciate this book. You can appreciate it just for the historical context of, you know, what the what these jewels represent in history and who wore them and why. It's so 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 interesting. Um, we had uh, a couple questions come in during the discussion and a couple beforehand. I'm going to start with this one, which gives us a chance to dive back into history a little bit. One audience member wanted to know, uh, Joanna, could you talk a little bit about what you discovered about the blue sapphire Buddha from the Altani collection? the the um the faceted the faceted um are we talking about the the so there's a buddha there's the buddha blue which is on its own or there is the actual little deity that's being carved from the altani collection is that what they mean i uh, they may be uh jennifer uh camp wrote that question perhaps she could clarify she's she just asked about the blue sapphire blue sapphire buddha from the, the little deity she said yeah, the little deity. Okay, yeah. I mean, I just when I saw that at the uh, at uh, the exhibition of the Altani, I yes, exactly. I just absolutely, um, I just loved it. I loved, I loved the fact again that it is a a Hindu deity that's been carved in a sapphire. Which, knowing that it's um, its potency because it is uh, you know part of um, Saturn. The planet Saturn. So I, I found that I found that very interesting that um, that was carved. But I don't know anything anything more than uh, than it's a 2.9 centimeters high, and it's a 37.82 carats, and it's an 18th century carving. And in fact, actually, at the beginning of my introduction, I've also there is another uh, little carved Buddha that is um, in the introduction, which is in the British uh, Natural History Museum in London. So you know, when things are so old, we can only assume quite a lot. Uh, we, you know, we, I, I find that uh, to, be able to, to be able to pinpoint in some of the early jewels, it is, it is very difficult to know what the meaning was behind it, what really it was. We can only we can only gauge, we can only sort of take an educated guess, I suppose. Okay, thank you so much. Um, someone else wanted to know if in the book, do you talk about Montana sapphires at all? Oh yes, absolutely. Yes, now if it hadn't been for, unfortunately, if it hadn't been for COVID, that's the one place I didn't get to. Oh. I, I got to Madagascar, I got to Burma, Sri Lanka, but I didn't get to Montana, but I have written a lot about Montana sapphires, obviously in relation with George Kuntz and Tiffany, and also uh, with the, um, the mines there now, with Mr. Keith, uh, Dr. Keith Barron. Um, I interviewed him who owns uh, one of the mines in, in Montana, but absolutely, yes. Well, you can put that on your post COVID bucket list. Yes, there's a special section um, that delves into each specific sapphire mining location. Okay, yeah, oh, exactly. wonderful, wonderful. Um, someone else wanted to know uh, a little bit of more uh, gemological question is, uh, they want to know exactly when and where did the practice of heating sapphires start? Well, that's always been, I mean, Roman times they would, heat them they call it snake bite uh when it's um you know you can heat a you can heat a stone with a with a with a, a blow 
um, a blowtorch. So they've been, it's been, it's been going since the Roman times, but um, it really has been uh, the 60s was when it was really, uh, when it really took off and, and the Thais uh, were the champions of heating stones. So that really is the 60s is when it really, really took off. Why did the Romans heat them? Ah, that's a good question. Why did the Romans heat them? I think a lot of, uh, I think possibly like most of these things, it happens, it happened unintentionally that a stone would, um, a stone would uh, increase its clarity sometimes if you're burning, if you can burn away the inclusions inside and also its, its, um, its color. But you know, a lot can be destroyed through heating. Heating is a, is a very technical process. Um, so I'm not saying, I'm not saying all stones were heated in Roman times, but it has been known that they did it then. But it, you know, it wasn't a common practice at all um, because you will see a lot of the stones which were from Sri Lanka are light colored stones anyway. They're very pale sapphires. And so they kept them that way, you know. They were more, I think they were more concerned about the inclusions, the surface reaching inclusions then, than, than the actual you, sort of color. As you mentioned, they thought that having inclusions reduced the stone's power. So that's why they exactly. wanted the inclusions. Yeah. Okay, and we have time for one more question today. Um, somebody said, hi, will Joanna tell us about her brooch? Ah. <laughs> yes. I've also, well, which I'm glad somebody question. else, because I've been wondering too. Well, well spotted, whoever, whoever, and I'm very, I'm very delighted. So this is, um, this is a brooch by John Donald, and uh, he's in my book, and he was very much uh, sort of the studio artist of the '60s, along with Grima, um, Alan Gard, all of Charles de Temple, all of that, all of that era. Uh, John is still is still uh, very much with us, and. Um, I saw this, I saw this, this came up at auction and I just thought I need a sapphire brooch when I'm talking about my book. So this is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but they're carved, they're, they're little sort of carved sapphires. And he made something very, uh, made one very similar for uh, Princess Margaret. He was very good friends with Princess Margaret and he made a lot of jewels um, for her. And so this brooch is in the book along with John. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Oh, it's beautiful. Man. It looks great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Joanna, thank you so much for joining us today. This was outstanding. And we know you're in the UK, so you're late coming on and we're totally infringing on your cocktail hour. So oh, we're going to no, wrap it up now. <laughs> Ashley is going to show us the book real quick. Oh. There it is. Sapphire okay. by Joanna Hardy. It is the last in the trilogy. Uh, it was ruby then emerald then sapphire did i get the order correct the other way emerald the first ruby. Two. Oh, so the emerald okay. has been reprinted and uh, for the third time and ruby's been reprinted for the second time and with the emerald with the third reprint we've got instead of the green pages we've got emerald inclusions so um and a wow. bit more content awesome well, great Perfect. Gift for any gemstone or history lovers in your life so joanna again thank you so much for being with us today and thank you to ashley for hosting today and of course to everyone in our audience who joined us um my next question is going to be returning next week we're going to be on again next tuesday that's december 14th at the same time 2 p.m eastern um it is going to be a special uh edition of my next question. All four national editors will be hosting a special end of year webinar. We're going to be looking back on the best and the worst of 2021. Um, you can sign up to attend that webinar on our site. I just dropped the link into the chat. Um, thanks again for joining us today and everyone please take care and happy holidays to all. Thank you.